Hi, everyone. I'm Aaron. I'm a design manager at Thumbtack. Uh, I lead the customer team. I've had many weird roles in the past. I've been a PM on the growth team before. I've been a designer. I've done some engineering. But I'm excited to chat with all these fine people here that work at Thumbtack. So we have Theo, who's a design manager on the customer team. He used to work on growth as a design lead. We have Cordelia, who's an experienced researcher who works on the pro team on both the experience and growth side. Rob is a PM. He works on the customer growth team. And Alyssa is a designer who works on the pro team and has done growth work in the past. So give them a big round of applause. They're up here. They're super excited to talk to you. Um, but to kick things off, I imagine not all of you have used Thumbtack before. And so I want to have Theo give you a brief explanation of like what we are, how we work, and why it's interesting and hard to design for growth at Thumbtack. Yeah, totally. Um, so just a quick overview of Thumbtack. Um, Thumbtack is a platform for hiring local service professionals across 500 plus different categories. And that's everything from a DJ to a landscaper. Um, and we get our pros to tell us the type of jobs they're interested in so that when customers reach out, they're talking to a pro who's actually interested and willing to do their job. Um, customer can send their project details and take the right next step to getting the job done directly on the platform. So one of the things that's really unique and interesting about Thumbtack being a marketplace is that we have very different sides. Um, customers and pros are very different. And so I'm curious, Theo, could you tell us a little bit about what makes it like, a challenging product to grow? What are some things that like, you've experienced on the customer side? Yeah, one of the interesting problems on the customer side is, actually comes from those 500 categories and the fact that that diverse category set has very different user experiences. Um, you know, for example, if I'm looking to hire a house cleaner, I'm probably interested in who's available this weekend and who's the most affordable. But if I want to hire a kitchen remodeler, I'm here to do research. I want to reach out to a lot of pros. I want to see examples of their past work. And um, maybe I just want to start with a consultation. So the problem we face when kind of um, you know, designing with a growth mindset is prioritizing the right projects and the right projects that will solve problems across all those different user experiences. And Alyssa, you are sort of on the flip side of the product. You have different challenges over there. What makes it really interesting and challenging for you in terms of thinking about growth? Yeah, so one thing to consider um, about our pros, a few things to consider here. Um, for many of our pros, they are building their businesses, and this is their livelihood. Um, and so it's really important that we build trust with pros um, because it, they're putting their, their business online, and um, we're helping to get them customers. Um, and another thing to note is that pros pay for leads on Thumbtack versus customers. Um, and so Thumbtack makes money when we match a customer with a qualified pro. And uh, the third sort of thing to note here is that it's a smaller user base with pros versus uh, customers. But this user base tends to repeat more. Um, and so we see pros coming back often to check their, the app for leads, for new messages. Um, and so those are a few kind of key distinctions. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about how we think about experimentation differently, um, considering the, the pro user base. Um, so we rely heavily on user research. We have a fantastic experience research team and usability testing um, to make sure that we're, we're on the right track and to de-risk bigger changes that really affect a pro's workflow. Uh, another thing is that we have pro sentiment surveys in product. Um, and yeah, those are a couple of, of key differences. Cool. So I think this is really interesting that a lot of companies may not experience is that we have one side of the product with like high repeat users and there's like a small set, you don't want to experiment too much. We have another side with tons of users coming through that maybe only engage with the product once or twice a year. And so it can be really, really tricky to figure out how to design consistently for growth across the entire experience. But that's why we're here to talk to y'all. It'll be fun. Um, so the next thing I'm really curious about is, we get asked a lot of questions during interviews from a lot of people. If we have just one specific growth team, if we think about growth as like a distributed function, is it everyone's responsibility? And so I'm kind of curious, Rob, what do you think when you think of like growth and whose responsibility is it? Sure, so I can talk first about the, the growth teams. We have not one, but two growth teams. A growth team on the customer side and on the pro side. Um, I sit with the growth team on the customer side. Um, but I'd also th say that growth is more 
kind of pervasive across Thumbtack as a company. Um, so from day one, when you join, um, even if you don't know about A-B testing or mixed shift or cohort analysis or all the, the good stuff that you're probably learning in this, um, this design program, um, you are thrown into the deep end and you will know all this stuff by the end of week two. And so we really kick off a growth-focused um, culture here. And the way we keep that going is through um, basically doing a lot of sharing on things that are working in terms of growth or um, you know, experiments that teams are running or even experiments that are happening like outside of the company. So this happens a lot on Slack or on email where someone will say, hey, I want everyone to take a look at this thing. Um, we tried this. This was our hypothesis. Here's what happened. It was either totally expected or completely unexpected. And other teams will go and say, oh, wow, wait, that was a cool analysis. I should pick that up. I should try something similar. Or like, wow, maybe that growth experiment um, could be completely relevant for the thing that I'm doing on my team. Um, so we start out with, um, you know, with growth kind of across the company and then um, kind of keep that going uh, through a lot of like pattern matching and a lot of sharing, uh, which I think is, is pretty tough to do. And I haven't really seen that at other companies I've been at. Um, so pretty proud of that. Anyone else want to talk about working on growth and collaborating with other people? No, okay. So I think that it, one of the things that Rob talks about that is really interesting that we kind of chatted about earlier was really we're focused on like learning a lot of the time. A lot of the times you think of like there's a growth team, they're like hacking away at stuff and really like hunting metrics. Um, but we really think about what do you want to learn? How do we sort of unlock that? And then how do we share that with other teams to either do their next sort of set of research, do experiments on the other side of the product. I remember when I was working on growth with Rob, um, I was doing a lot of A-B testing to figure out how we could get more native users on the customer side. And then six months later, I was on the pro side, I brought all that learning over there. And so it's not the most uh, um, in innovative thing in the world to share what you learn, but I think focusing on learning versus just hunting down metrics is super important. Yeah. Um, so we're also a very impact-driven design team. Um, we think a lot about quality, but also impact that we're gonna make, and we're also a very impact-driven company. And so we're all interested in how to accelerate growth. But I'm really curious, Cordelia and Rob in particular, how do you make sure we're not wasting time experimenting on the wrong things? Sure. Um, so as a researcher, obviously I wanna do research, but I am also one of three researchers supporting um, 10 product teams. So I wanna make sure we're researching the right stuff. Um, and I know when we're working with our PMs that they're also very concerned that um, when we're running experiments, um, we're running them on the right things because running an experiment um, actually takes a lot of work. Um, so one way we do that is by trying to make sure that uh, we're using research to really define the user problems and make sure that we're collaborating really tightly so that we're focusing on um, the problem areas where we can have the greatest impact. Um, I think about, um, and maybe this is a little wonky of me, but I, I think about um, Parkinson's law of triviality, which you can also think of as like the bike shed metaphor. Um, you're trying to build a nuclear power plant, um, but it's way more fun as, as a group to talk about like what the bike shed should be made out of. Basically this idea is that like we gravitate towards easy problems because hard problems are hard to think about. Um, so I try and work um, with PMs and designers to make sure that we're, we're staying really laser focused on the hard problems for our users and delivering that value. Yeah, I think to add to that, um, A-B testing is something that's really popular lately, but um, that is not the only way to test things. Um, and as Cordelia mentioned, it's actually kind of an expensive way to test things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, you know, it takes a lot of either edge work or analysis, um, but we do get like that, that perfect you know, causal answer and we know the exact answer. Um, but often there are, there are better ways to test things. There are faster ways um, to test and prove out your point. We can look at previous data. Um, like I was saying before, we could look at previous tests that either other teams have run or maybe maybe competitors have run, um, we can use some of the gut intuition that either we or other teams have, um, have built in the past. And that really helps accelerate things um, over just A-B testing every single thing. I actually worked um, at a previous company, um, worked with a, um, a writer who wanted to test, um, A-B test the Oxford comma. And that was just probably too granular and too slow of a test to run. Um, so we didn't actually end up testing the Oxford comma. We still won't know, um, you know what the, the proper comma usage is. Okay. Um, but uh, it just goes to show that we, we really can't A-B test everything. And if we, if we tried to, um, we would just move way slower than if we used a little bit more of, um, of the tools that we have at, at our disposal. 
Yeah, one thing one thing I would add too is that um, choosing the right thing is like a collaborative um, decision, or at least it should be. Um, one of the things that I really like about here is that designers, PMs, and engineers are responsible for prioritizing the type of experiments to do. So you have people who are representing, obviously, the experience, you know, the effort that it's going to take, and the business value that you can bring back to your company. So when you make decisions as a group and, and create your kind of experiment roadmap together, you're just going to come up with you know, experiments that you're going to get the most value and the most impact out of. Totally. I think that speaks really well to sort of growth being owned by everyone. It's not just all the teams, but it's also all the functions. Designers are writing specs, engineers are writing specs, PMs are writing specs. Um, pretty much everyone on the team is owning some part of the growth process, which is great. And it gives everyone that sort of like muscle to exercise. Totally. Um, so one thing I want to touch on that we talked about earlier is that one thing that's really interesting in the research team is that we have this cross-functional working group that includes marketing, product ops, um, analytics, and research. And I'm kind of curious if you'd speak a little bit about why that is really great at sort of prioritizing the right things to work on. Yeah, so we, uh, we have a working group that meets weekly, um, and we really use this as a forum to bring a lot of different functions together. We recognize that we all have different viewpoints, and we all have access to different information. So we use this as a time once a week to get together um, and work through current problems, while also making sure that everyone in that group is up to date on the information that's coming in and out of the organization, and then using that to uh, make decisions about um, what our blind spots are, what are actually knowns, known so that we can move forward on without either doing research or experiments, perhaps. The thing I love about this, sorry, I keep commenting on everything because I just think it's great. Um, so I've worked at companies where you're just hunting down numbers. It's great to get like other things sort of like informing what you're prioritizing and what's going on. I think it's great to look past the numbers to come up with growth ideas and then measure them over time, which is great. Um, so kind of building on that, experiments aren't always obvious wins for a company. Um, sometimes things are down, sometimes things are flat for your key metrics. And so I'm curious, how do you all think about the trade-offs in terms of when to ship something? Uh, so I'm on a team on the pro team called the targeting team, and we are a, an experienced team. We're not a traditional growth team. Um, however, in the last six months, we kind of worked on um, some features that were a little bit more growth oriented. Um, and one example is um, we wanted to enable more pros to turn on their targeting preferences. And what this would mean for them is that they would get more of the leads they want, they're more responsive to customers, and it's overall more beneficial for the marketplace. Um, and so we ran an experiment where after the pro accepts a lead, we ask if they're interested in turning on their preferences and get more leads just like that. And so we ran this experiment. We saw um, the enablement initially go down, uh, but we saw retention go up uh, for this feature compared to a baseline. And so this was a trade-off that we considered um, when we talked about a sort of a ship, no ship decision. Um, and it was really important to us uh, to um, improve pro comprehension of how this feature worked. And this comprehension is a little bit of a harder to measure outcome, but a signal like retention is very strong. Um, and so that's kind of one example of a trade-off. Uh, another example is that we recently worked on a sort of a one-click experiment. Um, so pros would turn on their preferences in one click. And what we saw with this was that um, we saw the refund rate go up along with the enablement rate. And we set out at the beginning of the project that we'd be comfortable with a certain amount of an increase in refunds. Um, and this, this experiment kind of exceeded that. And so we decided this is not an acceptable um, sort of threshold to ship. So we took this as a learning moment um, to step back and be more explicit in the product experience about what they were signing up for. And so design iterated on the, the experience and added clearer copy and a little bit more friction to the flow. And we just shipped this one, so um, stay tuned for the results on that one. So Rob, how do you, how do you think about like this sort of goal setting? Or whatever you're gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? So the question was, 
there aren't always obvious wins, and key metrics can be up or down. Sorry. And so how do you think about trade-offs when deciding to ship? Sure, I think just one more example of, um, uh, it, it comes up pretty commonly where we see actually a decrease in metrics, um, but, but we will actually ship something is um, really strategic efforts. Um, so there are quite a few examples where um, we will build and ship something um, and, and test it along the way. Something that we know is actually going to be negative on some of our core metrics, but we know it's going to be a step function change improvement in, in the user experience. And often it's, often it's not something that we can um, explicitly like slowly and incrementally test our way into through like many series of tests with like many different teams contributing. Um, so instead there's sort of a, a different strategy where we'll say, hey, this is the vision of like the new product. Maybe it's a year off, maybe it's two years off. Um, we know we're going to test this, but we're not going to test every single piece of it um, because it's a strategic effort. We know that at the beginning, it might be down on revenue, it might be down on um, you know, some of our really core metrics, but we know that we're going to improve that, and overall, it's um, eventually going to be a better experience. Um, so that's, I think, pretty common. Should we um, open it up to the audience? Sure, if we're running short time, do that. Huh? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I think it would be good. Here, I'll take, I'll take it. You guys don't mind. Okay, questions from the audience. Well, right back where I can see them because they're from the call. Hello, my Adobe friend. Hi. Um, so y you mentioned, uh, Alyssa, a little bit about uh, product design and growth design specifically, and I wanted to hear, are they ever at odds when you're making decisions? growth design and product experience design? Yeah. Are they ever at odds? That's a good question. I don't think of them as at odds necessarily. I think um, as product designers, whether we're working on a growth oriented product or like a core experience project, um, I think we're always looking to solve an important problem at the best interest of our business and our users, and in our case, our pros and customers. Um, and so, in my mind, a successful project is something that accomplishes both. We're growing the business and we're improving the, the product experience, um, no matter like the size or the, the scope of the project. Um, and so, I think while some projects are aimed at sort of quick wins or more metrics oriented, I think. Um, having that balance of making sure we are improving the overall sort of holistic product experience as well is something that, that we can kind of take on as designers and our responsibility. I can give a concrete example of that from the first half of this year. Uh, so I'm staffed to both um, a core experience team and a growth team. And we knew from research and feedback on our core experience that we were having a comprehension issue around a recent product change. Um, and so what we actually did as a growth team was we uh, experimented with a feature that would allow pros to better understand the customer experience by basically doing like a customer view of the product. Um, and we did this on the growth team, which wouldn't necessarily be obvious that that would be the team to do it, um, but we were operating off of a, a principle that comprehension um, would drive product usage because pros would understand um, the optimal behaviors to take in product. Um, and that feature was one of the most successful things we did in the first half of this year to drive um, adoption of certain features among our existing pros. And so I think that's an example of um, both of those goals going hand in hand and also the way that we tend to pass the baton between teams around um, growth and providing value to customers and users. Do you guys have marketing uh, marketers who work on the growth team as well or is it mostly product? Yeah, we have a um, product marketing manager who's um, on every team as well, so we tend to work really closely with them. Awesome. And how, well, here you we, have a question. We actually question. have another uh, uh, marketing team on the um, customer team, and then also uh, really starting on the, the pro side, um, a growth marketing team um, who basically build and own um, channels to help us grow on both customers and pros. Um, so you're going to have a separate team for growth marketing uh, and then, gr then growth product. Uh, right. The growth marketing team sits on the uh, on the growth product. On the team. growth product team. Okay, very cool. Okay, we have a question right here. Thanks. 
Hi. Um, thank you so much. This is fascinating. Um, my question is about marketplaces and how it diff you know, what your experience is designing for products that aren't marketplaces versus are marketplaces. What are the advantages or what have you learned in that environment? Because it's so it's quite unique. Yeah, so I think the question is, um, the, what are the unique challenges of designing for a marketplace? Yeah, I think um, the challenge is collaboration and trust. And the trust, when I, when I say that, I mean is you're working together and it's really easy for teams to get very like siloed and kind of um, be like, well, I just wanna optimize my team and my side of the marketplace's um, you know, metrics. And anything that the other side does that brings mine down, Man, I can't believe they're doing that. Like, what the? What's going on? Um, and that's where things get really bad, and, and the whole product doesn't grow. And it, it's really important for teams to trust each other that they have the best, you know, intentions when they ship new features. Um, and then it's really important for you know anyone on a team to work on building collaboration. So that can be things from sharing your work early and often, going and talking to people across the marketplace. Um, you know, one thing that we're thinking about right now is how can our design team, um, at least at our level, share our work and. Um, at the least, just showcase some of the problems that users have on the other side. Um, a big one is, for pros, customer intent. So if a customer you know, comes through, they submit a request, and a pro, uh, and they never get back to that pro, the pro can get really frustrated. Where on our end, you know, we're kind of, we have metrics that incentivize us to get as many customers as through as possible, so what, what that ends up happening is it's trying to create a balance of getting customers through but making sure they're intentful. Um, and that's a learning that came from the pro side um, and having the trust that that's the right thing to do and um, will holistically just make a better product. I want to ask you guys a little bit about hiring. So what do you look for when you hire somebody for your growth team? This is a good question. Hiring growth designers is very, very hard. Um, I think that Rob can actually answer this as well. But when I'm looking for someone for the growth team, I'm looking for someone who's like really motivated to learn and is really interested in sort of like the mechanics of the product and how to have impact on the product. I think that there's designers that are really oriented towards craft. There's designers that are really oriented towards like flows and experience. And there takes a special type of designer that wants to sort of create a really big impact and understand how a business works and then sort of dig in and work through that collaboratively. Um, and that's, that's a hard sort of like DNA to find in someone. What do you look for on your team, Rob? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think uh, on, on designers or really any role across the growth team, um, a couple of things that, that I look for first are, are just, are you, are, are you hungry, are you motivated, are you looking for um, impact? I think I put on a job description that we were looking for people who are impact-seeking missiles. Um, we had to remove that later, that was not appropriate. <laughs> um, but basically we're, we're looking for people who are looking for those opportunities um, and who are, who are curious about, in general, you know, just how, how do these things work? How, like what happens if we um, you know, try this thing? Or like, wait, why is this other company doing this? Wait, maybe there's like a, a growth opportunity there. Um, and so we're, we're looking for people who are not just content with um, maybe doing the like functional aspects of their job, but um, you know, outside of work, they're thinking, oh wow, this could be an opportunity. This could be an opportunity for, for Thumbtack or for growth. Um, I'm trying to get my team to think about you know, growth ideas in the shower, um, which is going varying degrees of well. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're looking for that kind of motivation. Do, do you guys think that being an entrepreneur is a quality that you look for when you hire somebody for the growth team? But minus the fact that they want to work for a company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is. I mean, certainly it's not the, the only qualification, but I think, um, you know, there's a lot of overlap there. In, yeah. um, as an entrepreneur, you may be um, doing something slightly different every day and looking for those opportunities that may not be super easy um, to find that may not just like present themselves, you sort of have to be looking around for them. Um, I would almost say that I index towards people who've been freelancers before because they understand all the parts of the business and all the different sort of things that need to happen and building collaboration um, more than entrepreneurs in particular for growth designers. Awesome. Okay, we have time for one final question. And it's over there, so now that means that I have to 
find my way over there. I might you pass the mic. Hi. So now that you mentioned freelancers, um, what can a freelancer do for uh, moving from uh, from just having like a work that uh, like a portfolio primarily from like personal projects and Upwork into actually like building a presence and you know joining a joining a company like Thumbtack? Do you want to take this one? You want to take it? So Alyssa was a freelancer. So I, okay, th this is probably a good question for me to answer because I was freelancing for about a year and a half before joining Thumbtack full time, almost two years ago. Um, and so what I was doing at that time was uh, working with a mix of entrepreneurs and small businesses uh, that were local businesses and also doing tech contracts. Um, and this was a really nice mix for me um, in terms of project work. And Thumbtack was one of my clients. So I worked with Thumbtack for about three months and did a couple projects and was really inspired by the mission and the people that worked here. Um, and I didn't want the contract to end and um, really fortunate that I was able to join full time. Um, and so I did go through sort of an abbreviated interview process um, because I had worked with a team and developed that relationship and they got to know how I work. Um, but I built up my portfolio to kind of uh, fit the type of work that I'd be doing at Thumbtack. Um, and so I sort of had that personal narrative of I really care about small businesses and helping entrepreneurs build their businesses at scale. Um, but then the project work that I showed was mostly like tech um, uh, product design projects. Um, and so wanted to show my process and how that aligns with the way that Thumbtack's designers work. So, you know, sh sh framing a story of a clear problem definition and who are we designing for? Um, what were our goals with this work? How did we achieve this outcome? Um, those are all kind of important things that we look for when we're building out our design team. Yeah, I don't know if anyone here uh, is working at an agency or has worked in more consulting type background, but that's where I started out. I worked for a company called Otopod and um, did a lot of digital marketing, e-commerce, and um, you know, I wanted to get into product design. I wanted to see the impact of my work. I wanted to talk to users more. And I, I think the way to do it was to get in through a growth role um, because the projects are a lot, can be a lot smaller. They can be those little pebbles. Um, and being a designer who um, works at an agency, like speed is obviously money and time, and that's a huge skill that you can kind of sell. Is like, hey, I know how to work fast. Um, you know, I have very sharp, you know, visual design skills. Um, I think I would fit very well in, in a growth role, and that gives you know you the opportunity to get into um, an in-house tech company, but um, also gives you the ability to continue learning and like pick up those. Um, kind of like product and and product design skills of like being iterative, um, learning to think big, but then break that down um, and and walk on that path. And um, yeah. So I want to give one more question to the group if we have oh, time. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I panels, I always want to have like one thing I can take away if nothing else. And so the last question we have here is. What's one tactical recommendation, recommendation that you four have for everyone here today to start working on in the real team? If they could do it tomorrow. So one recommendation I have is to leverage past learnings. So whether you've been on a team for a while or you're joining a new team, I think asking people, what have we learned in the past, both from successful experiments and experience experiments that didn't go so well. Um, I think leveraging kind of learnings from the past can really help to inform what we do or don't do in the future. Um, and that kind of also speaks to the importance of documenting the outcomes from experiments uh, along the way. Uh, for me, I think it's having a prioritization framework for ideas. Um, so um, we only have a limited amount of time. We have to work on the most impactful um, and basically the lowest hanging fruit ideas first. Um, and so a prioritization framework I like is called RICE, 
It's an acronym that stands for reach, impact, confidence, and effort. And so for every idea that you brainstorm, like on the, on the whiteboard or with sticky notes, um, you, um, you rice it. You say, I think it will reach X number of people. It will impact them this way. I have X confidence it will work, and this is the effort. Um, and it just helps you work on like the most important things first. Um, and it also gives a shared framework for everyone to say, oh, now I know how things are prioritized, which is also pretty helpful. A uh, rice, which is a framework for um, for prioritization, for taking an idea and saying rice, rice, R I C E. So reach, impact, confidence, and effort. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be a user researcher if I didn't say uh, start by thinking about your user problem. Um, so I think it's really easy um, when we're thinking about experiments to start with um, our hypothesis or what we want to happen. Um, but I think that we can keep ourselves honest um, and keep the focus on learning if we make sure that we're framing each one of these experiments or bets um, with a really solid user problem because there, there's so many different um, solutions, um, but getting really tight on the problem is a really good first step. Yeah, and then I would just add having a tool um, to track all of your experiments. So a lot of people use Coda, one of the teams I'm on uses um, Google Sheets, um, but you know we run anywhere from 15 to 30 experiments each quarter. So you know having a way to keep everybody accountable, um, make sure you're on track, um, and make sure that you hold like retros and you take notes for what what to do next. Um, that's just going to keep that train rolling, and it'll be a lot easier to just pick up steam, find those little veins that are working really well, and and do some more tests in that area. So having that that way to track your work um, will just make it a lot easier. Aaron, you have oh, one I have one too. too. Um, what is mine? I didn't think of one. So I think that one of the things that I think about a lot is learn more about parts of the business you don't know anything about. One of the things that's made me better at growth is understanding how marketing works, understanding how the business team prioritizes goals, understanding just how anything functions, even like how the support team triages tickets. The more you know about the whole business and how it works, the better you're going to be at prioritizing projects and growth um, and just kind of being a better citizen at your company. We'd like to say thank you to the Thumbtack growth team. <laughs>